Today on Monkey Life. At the Parks Hospital, it's all systems go for Vet Thesar Sastre and the team, with a patient list including Marmoset Jenny. Oh, hello. Yes. Capuchin Abby. Yeah, he's full of pus down there. And Squirrel Monkey Lopez. Right, so let's have a look at this. Yeah, beautiful. No chest metastasis. That's good. Plus, the chimps go potty for porridge pots. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. Everybody's well aware that they need to be looked after carefully. They should be okay. The park provides a home for more than 260 primates from 24 different species. It's going to be a busy day at the park's hospital. Vet Thesar Sastre has arrived with a packed schedule ahead of him. He has a number of small primates to examine. And although nothing major is scheduled, he does have some delicate procedures on his list. First up is female marmoset Jenny. Oh, hello. Yes. You are talking a lot. Um... <laughs> Jenny has a lump in her mouth, and it's a sort of recurring lump. We've already operated once and removed some of it, and so Fedor's now going to give her an anaesthetic and have a look and see what the lump's doing, why it's growing, and how much it's grown, and potentially actually remove more of it again this time. And hopefully she'll be a bit more comfortable when we're able to remove some of that, that swelling in, in her gum. Jenny arrived last year, having been rescued from the British pet trade. She'd lost her partner, and her previous owner realised she couldn't take care of her properly. She came with a large lump on her face, which on inspection proved to be benign. Thesar surgically removed as much of it as he could. But a year later, the lump has once again increased in size. Wow, it's pretty big. It's growing back. I'm going to try to take a chunk out of it. If I can. Thesar doesn't think it will be a long procedure, so his next patient needs to be prepped and ready. Oh, I'm going to be quick on this. OK, let me have a look. OK, Toby, Thesar thinks he's going to be quite quick with this, so if you can crack on and get Abby crated and brought up here, please. At the Capuchin Lodge, Toby is preparing to crate up Abby. She has dental issues which need urgent attention. Back at the hospital. OK, let's go for it. Thesar gets to work. But just like last year's operation, it's not straightforward. So hard. Yeah. That is actually difficult to resect. So you see how I'm peeling it off for the, from the jawbone, actually. He has to remove the lump bit by bit. OK, we finish that little bit. He's excised as much as he can. This is going to come back, eh? I don't really want to do it till, till it's actually causing trouble to the animal next time. Just leave it there till, till it's causing trouble Unless to this animal. Unless it's affecting her eating or if it's bleeding or exactly. something, yeah. Exactly. Abby's here, wow. You guys are doing really well today. OK, that's it. Yeah, she can go. As Jenny leaves in her box to recover, the next patient is brought in. Abby is an older female capuchin and lives with Erico's group at the lodge. She's on long-term medication for arthritis. But a week ago, the primate care staff noticed a large swelling on her face. So Abby is very old. Because she was wild caught, her age is only an estimate, so about 31, certainly over 30. And whenever we have any of those older animals down for an anaesthetic, it is always a bit of a worry and a bit of a risk. Um, a dental normally is quite straightforward, but um, it doesn't always mean to say that it goes well. So we'll always keep our fingers crossed and hopefully um, she will cover really well. But certainly being an older animal, it does come with a lot more complications. 
Thazar intubates Abby so he can control the anaesthetic whilst working on her teeth. Fantastic. Before proceeding, he gives her a quick general health check. Wow, she's really arthritic. Uh, on the hips. She's very arthritic on the knees as well. That's why the muscle wastage here. Yeah. Hey, that comes with age, I'm afraid. There's no masses in the tummy. Tummy feels fine. Now liver, gonna feel it, that's good. Okay. Today's issue becomes obvious when Thesar takes a look inside Abby's mouth. Right, so there is a couple of teeth here that they look a bit dodgy. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah, okay. Actually, you can, yeah, it's full of pus down there. Okay, anyway, let's crack on and do this. The two rotten teeth may be the cause of Abby's abscess. They need to come out. The one down there. Okay, oof, mamma mia. As Thesar works, he discovers more teeth need removing. So I think I'm gonna take it take it out as well, and in fact, yeah, it is slightly wobbly. In all, six teeth, one incisor and five molars are extracted. I'm hoping that it will really help her. She's not gonna be any, in any pain, and yet yeah, should make eating a lot better for her. Abby's gums will soon harden, and she'll be able to use her remaining teeth to eat. She'll be given a course of antibiotics and pain relief, and will soon be back to her normal self. But for Thesar, there's still a lengthy queue in the waiting room, as there are more small primates needing his attention. The park stretches across 65 acres and is home to areas of natural woodland and many native plants. Throughout the seasons, the teams keep an eye on what the land offers up that could be used to enrich the lives of their charges. Today's lucky recipients are the park's eight stump-tailed macaques. The small monkey team have come across some insect-laden rotten logs for the group to enjoy. Hopefully there's bugs and things inside there, and the stump is hopefully to come out, rip it all to pieces, enjoy some nice treats. Um, the stumpies destroy everything, so it's kind of nice to give them an enrichment they can destroy, um, and then we don't have to worry about them eating something they shouldn't do. But this, it's all natural, they can destroy it, they can throw it around as much as they want and have a great time. As well as insects and bugs, the stumpies can eat the bark. It provides good roughage and benefits their digestion. So it's not going to be a huge effort for the stumpies to get um, into them. But as you can see, they're quite rotten here and then they just get a little bit harder. So hopefully they'll get through all this bit first. Um, and then as the rain hits the rest of it over the next coming weeks and months, they'll be able to get the rest of it as well. The logs are placed all around the enclosure, giving everyone the chance for a good old forage. The two lowest ranking boys, Toto and Freddy, are let out first, to give them a head start over the more dominant Stumpies. And with the high rankers absent for now, Toto takes the opportunity for a little display. Freddy, however, gets stuck straight in. He's now fully recovered from his recent dental operation to remove a large canine, which had caused an abscess. He's a clever Stumpy who, unlike Toto, totally understands the social etiquette required within the group. He understands all the social cues, all the behaviours. Um, he kind of knows where to slot himself and, and when to do certain things. He seems to really understand how to be a macaque, which is really nice. Now, we only know him from living with one other female before he came to us, but he may have lived with others before then, and his behaviour certainly indicates that, whereas Toto for what we knew, lived on his own for a very long time. And again, his behavior indicates that he just doesn't know how to behave socially. In the last few months, there have been signs that Toto's developing a better relationship with the others and learning to integrate more. It's just as well because here they come to join in the bug hunt. The rotten logs have grabbed everyone's attention. They get to work scraping and foraging and munching everything in sight. Sam is the boss of the group. At 34, he's getting on in life, but he's still loved and respected by the ladies. Kelly is the dominant female and the largest in the group. She 
absolutely loves her food. The other girls are Noreen, Charlie, Sylvie and Flo. Stumpies are notoriously grumpy with each other and squabbles often break out, reminding the lower rankers of their place. But with so much to keep them interested, today's minor spat is soon forgotten. I think this enrichment has been a great success for the Stumpies, yeah. They all seem to have had a little bit of a go, some more than others, but um, I think it's definitely worked well for them. They seem to be a really good um, kind of rottenness, so they've found it quite easy. I think if it's if it's not so rotten and it's a bit difficult, they could get a bit bored quicker, but they've really taken a lot of time over these logs, particularly Freddy, he seems to really enjoy it, but everyone's had a go and everyone seems to have had a good time. Thirteen years ago, the park took on its biggest ever mission. Rescuing and rehoming 88 capuchin monkeys from a laboratory in Chile. With so many different characters, abilities and health issues, settling all 88 capuchins into groups where they could coexist was a huge task. To this day, the team continued to adjust and evolve the five social groups, which were formed to accommodate their needs. With so many capuchins to look after, it's important to be able to check each one to ensure they're happy and healthy. The species is widely recognised as highly intelligent, and many of those at the park have been trained in behaviours that assist the care staff with their day-to-day -day care. This is where it goes wrong sometimes, is you end up with two capuchins on the scales at the same time. Today, Donna and Katie are training two of the park's younger and very enthusiastic males. Fabian! Good boy. Fabian and his boss, dominant male Franco, are being taught to take a voluntary hand injection. Side. That's not really what we want. Can you give it to me properly? Watch your back. Side. Good boy, that's better. Very good. It's a useful behaviour for the capuchins to master in case they need medication via a syringe. Oh, you're amazing. Or, in the worst case, an anaesthetic before a hospital procedure. The first thing we do is train them to present the area that we need to inject. So with the capuchins, we actually get them to present the whole of their side so that we have the option of their arm or their thigh to inject into. Um, once they've got that behaviour, uh, we move on to what we call our, well, it's kind of like a fake needle, really. Um, so it's just got a paper clip in the end, and this just gets them used to there being a syringe round and, and it touching them. Side. Good boy, that's better. They also know that they only get rewarded when they give us the behaviour that they want. It's good for the keeper and primate relationship um, to gain that trust with them. But it is also really good for the capuchins as well because they are such bright and intelligent individuals and it's really important for us to try and keep their brains busy and motivated and keep them always thinking. And we do that as much as we can within the groups with other different types of enrichment. But training is another way that we can do that um, and it just gives them something different to think about. Franco is a great leader, loved by all his ladies. Fabian, although high ranking, doesn't receive as much adulation, and this sometimes causes him to lash out. I don't know whether it's frustration or what it is, but he can just be very disruptive, and sometimes that turns to aggression, and we do go through phases where we have a lot of injuries throughout the group, which is just something that we don't want. So one thing that we have used with Fabian in the past is an implant, and that just suppresses some of those behaviours a little bit. Um, he hasn't actually had the implant for the last sort of two or three years because um, he seems to be quite settled in the group at the moment. But there is obviously that option in, in the future we might need to do that again. So we're just getting prepared really so that if in the future we need to do that, then he is already injection trained. The two young males are making great progress. For Donna and Katie, only another 68 capuchins to go. Back at the hospital, a long day for vet Thesar Sastre and the primate care team is coming to an end.
the final patient has just been brought in. It's Lopez, a young and effervescent squirrel monkey who has a lump on his leg that needs examining. He is very alive. Lopez never sits still really very much. And then the lump doesn't seem to be bothering his mobility in any way. He's still using that leg fine. Sometimes when we try and manipulate it and feel it just to check whether it's got any bigger, he gets a bit annoyed with us, maybe so it's slightly tender and hurting him a little bit. But then other times he's perfectly fine with us touching it. So we're not quite sure whether it is bothering him or not. We don't think so most of the time, but it'd be good to get a check over, make sure it's not malignant um, and just figure out what it is and make sure if it is something bad that it's not spread anywhere else. One of the park's youngest and most boisterous squirrel monkeys, Lopez was rescued four years ago, along with Logan and Lucille. He's so bouncy that when he's on the move, it's hard for the team to get a good look at the growth. But they can tell it's grown substantially in size in recent weeks. How old is Lopez? Um, he's about six. Thazar shaves away the fur so he can get a closer look at the lump. He's definitely on top of the calf, but there's something here that it feels almost like he's, if he has had a trauma in there. Thazar is slightly perplexed. Vet nurse Saffron, who's been keeping an eye on the swelling, thinks it may have shrunk in the last few days. He's definitely a mass. He's gone down, which is good news, so this is not malignant. He cannot be. If it was malignant, this is not going to go down. No. Now, it's, it's quite attached to muscle in there. So I think attempting it to remove it today, if I don't really need to, would be a mistake. To make absolutely certain, Thazar wants to take a series of x-rays, which could rule out secondary growths elsewhere in the body. Right, so let's have a look at this. Yeah, beautiful. No chest metastasis. That's good. To everyone's relief, the x-rays are all clear. Plainly, something going on there. Let's take a surgical biopsy, and then we know exactly what we are dealing with. Taking a small sample of the lump and sending it off to a laboratory for analysis, along with blood tests, should provide an answer. I don't know if this could be trauma, simply that. Um, the truth is that it's still there, and when, when I took the biopsy, it looked like a proper lump. So we are going to send it to the laboratory and see what, what it is. So I've got all the information I'm going to need from this animal. It's absolutely healthy. Look, it's stunning. Um, it's beautiful, and, and it's got a perfect coat. And so I'm hoping this is something not very serious. The health checks are over for the day. Lopez can be returned to his house, and Thazar, the primate care team, and the monkeys can have a well-earned rest. Thank you. Sunshine at the park is welcomed by the 260 primate residents and their carers alike. But it's a different story when the temperature drops and there's a chill in the air. Then, enticing the animals, including the four groups of chimpanzees outside, needs a bit more thought and planning. All our primates here come from one tropical country or another. Obviously, chimps obviously come from Africa, and it's, yeah, it's a tad warmer in Africa than here. Now, you know, it's not really such a massive problem as long as you cater for it, and all our houses are maintained around 20 degrees centigrade. You know, it just means you're going to have a big heating bill, and we never lock anybody outside, so they've always got access inside it so they feel cold, and they're all, they're all bright enough to realise that, hey, it's a bit cold out here, let's go inside. And, you know, it, it really is that simple. The bigger problem is keeping everybody entertained and, you know, and then that's us to, to invest in that. The team go to great lengths to make that happen. At Bart's, on this chilly morning, the staff are putting out a breakfast of fruit and something else to warm the group up. Cups of hot porridge. They're being distributed all around the enclosure to encourage the chimps to actively search for them. You, you need to break things up a bit. Every different sort of thing that you put in for, you know, for amusement or entertainment, don't do it every day. If you have your favourite thing every day, it'll soon become boring. So you just mix it up and, um, you know, some days they'll get a cardboard box to play with, other days 
you know, you'll, you'll get something else, you know, whatever, whatever's going. The group are let out and immediately make a beeline for the hot porridge pots. The chimps gather as many as they can carry. Gamba needs to be a bit more careful with his. Much of it's hitting the deck. There's plenty to go round. Even the low rankers, like Lola, have grabbed their share. She's making sure she gets every last drop. In this group, only Bart and his sister Eddie were born at the park. Most of the others were stolen from the wild and sold into the black market trade. Five of the park's original nine chimps are in this group. Cindy, Zoe, Beth, Buster and Mickey. They were all originally smuggled into Spain as infants and then used and abused as beach photographer's props. But thanks to the tireless work of campaigners Simon and Peggy Templer, who dedicated their lives to rescuing mistreated chimps, they were eventually confiscated by the Spanish authorities. Alison's late husband Jim Cronin set up Monkey World to give these nine and all future rescued chimps a permanent home. Jeremy has been at the park since its inception and remembers the first chimps arriving. Really, there was no introductions necessary or anything because Simon and Peggy had done an excellent job with them. And, and really, when you've rescued an animal, that is the time to establish it, introduce, do introductions and all the rest because they are so, they are so sort of broken, if you like. And, you know, they're much more subordinate, they're much more easygoing, they're much more tolerant. There was no, there was no aggravation amongst them. 34 years on and the five are still incredibly close. But they're slowing down as old age creeps up on them. Down, guys! There's nothing wrong with their appetites, however, as they welcome a continuation of the winter warming food menu. A snack of hot potatoes arriving in the enclosure courtesy of the care team is much appreciated by all. Next time on Monkey Life. Tragedy at the park, with the loss of a hugely admired, much loved key member of the team. The tibias are a bit wonky. <laughs> As Alison and Jeremy pay tribute to their colleague, highly respected, world-renowned wildlife vet, John Lewis. It's a serious blow, not only for us, but globally for wildlife conservation. This is a very sad, sad loss.